Coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. This is the sentence that really blew my mind. I didn't want to go to my grave thinking that I was a link in some chain of human interaction leading to someone else's serious illness or death. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, just, you should, like, if, if that is what you want, you, you should remove yourself from all human society. Like, I, I remember reading in, in grade school about the Janes, Janists, I think yeah. they're called, these people <laughs> that, like, pick the bugs out of their lettuce before they eat it. Like, they're... That human life just is being involved in long chains of, of human interaction. So it's like even the thing that they're signaling with the masks makes no sense. Hello, hello, and welcome to the roundtable. As you can probably tell, this is not your usual roundtable setup. If you're listening to my voice, you know that I am not Ryan Williams, our publisher and president who usually hosts this weekly podcast from the American mind. We are uh, remarkably short staffed this week. In fact, it's one of our two handers, which if you've been with the show for a while, you may recall from time to time. Uh, we do one of these. In this case, it's uh, myself, Spencer Clavin, the associate editor of the Claremont Review Books and the American mind. And I'm joined from New York by managing editor Seth Baron, James, Matt, and Ryan are all out because they are in D.C. We've just had a big event on dealing with woke capital at the Claremont's uh, at the Claremont Institute's Center for the American Way of Life. J.D. Vance gave an address, a number of other big speakers. You can find it now on YouTube if you go to the Claremont Institute's YouTube channel, to which, by the way, you should also subscribe. Uh, you can see some of what, what went on. But I'll start, actually, uh, Seth. You were you were there, were you not? At this, at yes, this yes I was. I was. And, uh, do you want to just give us a little quick update about it before we get into the main... <clears throat> Topic. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, it was just a half a day conference, but uh, it, it was great. It was very interesting. There were two panels, like one sort of laying out the problem of woke capital and, and what's going on. And two, like, how do we how do we address it? Um, and there was, yes, uh, J.D. Vance gave the keynote address and um, Representative Jim Banks of Indi Indiana Mm -hmm. uh, who is the head of the Republican Study Committee? Uh, gave a very, a very good um, talk as well. Uh, no, it, it was terrific. I, 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 I highly recommend that everyone check out the the YouTube um, version. You know, the, it, it was streamed, and yeah. it's on YouTube. Uh, but it was, um, it, it was remarkably dense and lively. Yeah, it looked wonderful. I was I was sorry I couldn't be there. Uh, Representative Banks, for those who don't know, has has written for us for the American Mind in the past. He's an ally and a really, um, really I, I think stalwart, robust conservative. And Vance, of course, author of Hillbilly Elegy and rising star, I think in in the conservative movement. It's it's fair to say. So yeah, just one more time, you can go to the YouTube channel to check that out. It was your first time. Uh, we've talked about this before on Tell Me What You Really Think, but you hadn't you hadn't met a lot of us before, right? So so how was how was meeting the, your colleagues in person? Uh, it it was it was nice. It was good to meet um, Ryan and Matt and James in person, and you know other people too. Yeah, uh, and it, it also to see a lot of familiar faces that I knew from my previous uh, previous lives. Um, yeah, it was it, it was great. And one thing that was nice about it. Um, you know, we, nobody had, nobody was wearing masks and huh. it was just a normal function. And it was remarkable how quickly everything just seemed to go back to, to normal. Just like, Oh, hello. How are you? You know, oh, good seeing you. Um, yep. it, it, it seemed, it didn't even seem weird to be talking to people face to face and no masks. Um, it made me hopeful that the whole last year and a half or so will just be like a bad dream mm. and that we'll forget about it. I mean, I think there's going to be other effects like economic right. and social effects, but in terms of, 
you know, how people relate to each other. I, I, I think social interaction, face-to-face interaction is so hardwired mm-hmm. that it's not going to be like a major, a major problem getting back to getting back to reality. Yeah, you know, our colleague, Chris Caldwell, who writes uh, for the Claremont Review of Books and, and is an editor there as well, um, mentioned to me that he'd been reading up a little bit on the Spanish flu, the, the 1918 to 1920 pandemic. And he said that that sense of sort of, you know, vanishing swiftly as a dream was was very much what happened in in the Spanish flu. People just moved right on. They wanted to forget about it. They didn't want to talk about it. It it became yesterday's news very, very quickly. Um, And as far as I'm concerned, like, you know, (laughs) they can't come quickly enough. I have this weird experience, maybe you can relate, where, you know, I did so little to actually, you know, shut my life down and very quickly started just ignoring a lot of these mandates and so even though, yes, my life is, as it were, returning to normal gradually here in, in Tennessee, I'm also not having the experience that so many people around me are having, which is I've been through this harrowing experience of total isolation, and now my life is transforming again. Like I, 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 To me, it just sort of feels like, oh, everybody is coming back, <laughs> back around. Do you know what I mean? Um, I do. I do. Uh, we have seen... Uh, I mean, I... I've been somewhat, you know, isolated, I guess, but I haven't really done anything, done anything personally that made, I haven't really closed my life down necessarily. Right. But um, it does seem like people are reacting to the, to the uh, lift, lifting of mask restrictions of the last week, uh, kind of unexpectedly. I mean, the, the, the reaction from, the the maskers has been has been kind of or or from the from the emasculated as I like to call them. Uh, <laughs> That's very good. You did you just call it that just now, or is that have you been? Uh, I've, on that? I've had it. I've had it <laughs> rattling around. Oh, good. Um, okay, glad to be the source, the the place for its debut. But um, they they seem to be kind of uh, like wrong footed. They don't know what to do with themselves now. Uh, have have you have have you noticed this? Yeah, this is um, well, right. Let, I mean, let's let's talk about masking, you know, so so I guess I'm trying to remember the timeline, right? The CDC came out and said what everybody knows, which is that you can't transmit the virus and you're very unlikely to catch the virus if you are vaccinated, since that's what, you know, vaccinations do. And so therefore, vaccinated people can go around without their mask on. And what's interesting to me about the development from there on is that a lot of restrictions then subsequently started lifting. Here in Tennessee, almost immediately, they said, well, on Friday, we're we're taking the mask mandate away. Um, And and so even though it's technically the CDC guidance only applies to vaccinated people, I think we have effectively resisted the idea of a vaccine passport, at least to the extent that that's not really a going concern, it, it, you know, in a red state, for example. I, I hope that I'm not wrong about this, but it, it seems as if like the idea that you were going to have your vaccination status checked at the door has has been kind of shouted down. And, and so the Biden administration then pivoted to this just truly catastrophic messaging. I mean, they, they do not hear themselves, I guess, at this point, but that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and even I think Hillary Clinton released this thing like the rule is now get vaccinated, get your life back. So like the premise of this is like we, we have taken your life and you can you may only have it if you if you do what we say. Meanwhile, like everybody is just kind of at least where I am, like max mask restrictions are, are really loosening. Um, but yeah, the the real mask extremists have like gone into this crazy tailspin. Like there was a piece in The Atlantic by, an, by a writer I kind of like, Dana Stevens, even though she's not, you know, we're politically not aligned, but I, she's a film critic. I like her her work. She wrote a piece basically saying like, this is a, a, a like a symbolic act. Like I'm, I'm continuing to wear the mask, even though I'm vaccinated, even though it now says that I can go around without the mask because I just want people to see it signals a commitment to public health. It signals a commitment to community, whatever, you know. Um, and this is now, it seems to be the, the going the going line. I mean, you're in New York, so I guess are, are people like way more stringent about this stuff around uh, me? People, people seem to still be wearing uh, masks a fair amount. 
Well, I mean, what's just so great about it is that it totally gainsays the whole idea that mask wearing was, that the mandate was driven by science. <laughs> yeah. Nothing, there was no new scientific fact that emerged that changed things the other day, like yeah. last week. It's clear. I mean, so everybody's kind of annoyed, but in different ways. Like the right is, a well, I don't know if we're annoyed, but we're kind of gleeful because it's now, it, they've now essentially admitted that the whole thing was only theater. Yeah. That they were losing control of the narrative and that people were going to stop wearing masks anyway, and they may as well just deal with reality. Or, you know, I don't know if it was because of the gas, gas prices and inflation. And, you know, I don't know what the polling was like, but for whatever reason, the Biden administration decided to say that, okay, you don't have to wear masks anymore. Or perhaps it was because, you know, they've been trying to get people to be vaccinated and they, you know, they realized, well, we need to have some kind of carrot. <laughs> so, you know, like an incentive. This is the yeah. big thing now. How do we incentivize it? So get your freedom. You get, you know, de Blasio was making comments today about how people deserve to have some, like, you know, they've, they've worked hard and they yeah. deserve to have more freedoms given back to them. It's like, this is not the notion. I mean, forgive me if I'm wrong, but in America, freedom is not something that we are allowed by the government. No, no it's like I mean, fundamentally <laughs> antithetical to the premise of the whole nation. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> And yes, uh, Biden put out that tweet that said, the new, here's the new rule, get vaccinated or wear a mask. It's your choice. It's like, but the, here's the funny thing is, and this is one of the ways in which uh, America is really kind of odd these days, which, okay, like if we were Singapore or China or South Korea, that really would be the rule. Right. Get vaccinated or wear a mask. Like they could easily in those places say, yeah, if you've been vaccinated, you wear this badge and sure. we'll check on it. You know, we'll know. But here, and I think a lot of it has to do with our diversity obsession and our inequality and you know, like, like our whole fixation on the idea of disparate impact. Mm -hmm. We could never impose any kind of mandate on restrictions of, of anything, really, because mm -hmm. it would be inevitable that, the, um, that their execution would, would desperately impact certain minorities. Or huh. even if it didn't, it, th there would be a very good chance of it. Or the, that it would create the appearance of it. So they're never going to start like being like, oh, well, you can't come in unless you show us your vaccine card. So the whole thing just becomes the honor system. You know, Ted Cruz had a funny tweet. He said, oh, well, if you don't like the application of the honor system to vaccination, uh, well, now you know how we feel about voting. <laughs> so <laughs> this is, I mean... On the one hand, you're right. The logic of disparate impact, like, just makes it impossible. Sort of maneuvers them to this corner, where if you can't require IDs to vote, how can you possibly require a you know documentation of medical status? When especially when when medicine is one of the things that they've been going on and on about how you know how inequitable it is that that poor people don't get enough care that trans people are denied care that that black people don't get enough care right? and if 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 that's true then making the vaccine passport into a sort of ticket to regular life is as you say deeply contradictory but my other my other gut instinct and this is my question for you i guess is in such cases it sort of seems like they they would just ignore it like they just ignore the illogic i'm thinking of the mask mandates specifically right like homeless people don't wear masks 
like a vast majority of the time, unless they're panhandling in places where they feel like it'll, you know, it'll help or, and, and, and like, in fact, it's almost impossible to notice that if you walk through like impoverished communities, there's like much less interest in, I mean, I have sudden, I have felt like way more at home all of a sudden in like, you know, dive bar random places, because it's just like people there are not as wedded to the official narrative or, or whatever, or they're, or they're maybe not even as, as aware of it. Anyway, like all of the ire, however, and all of the enforcement has been directed at kind of like affluent, um, to, uh, like sort of traditional middle America or, or even just, you know, middle class of middle America. And I sort of feel like if these problems that you're described, if they had their way, I, I kind of think they would enforce a vac they would impose a vaccine passport and then these these inconsistencies would arise and they would just ignore them. Like they would just let people in if they were the right skin color or the right socioeconomic class. But maybe do you think that's just too obvious? A form they of might, but, you know, there, there's so many ways. And, and in a way, this is one of the things that's nice about America is that we are like this disaggregated republic and everything has to be done at the local level. And so it's just a mess. Like, how the hell would they ever enforce? They couldn't enforce anything, especially with a disease that's highly communicable, but not really that deadly. So, I mean, it would just be pointless and aggravating and annoying. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's funny how quickly the, the, the vaccine passport thing seems to... I mean, I don't know, maybe it'll come back, but it seems like... You know, they, they floated that balloon and now it's gone. Um, but I do really enjoy the consternation of liberals who have now openly, this is, I mean, they, we all knew this all along, but now they're all openly saying, well, I need to wear a mask so people don't think I'm a Republican. Mm -hmm. like, what? I, I mean, I kind of always intuited that anybody on the street who wasn't wearing a mask, you know, in preferred freedom to slavery right. but now they're all admitting no no we want to be slaves we yeah we, 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 and it's important to us to show i mean this is like the ultimate like masking was the ultimate triumph of like the blue nose and the <laughs> puritan it, and now they're just like like they're caught with their pants down <laughs> it's um it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there is the, there's the, like the David Hogg, you know, and, and this is all over Twitter now. People really are like, if, if you're not on Twitter or if you're not, you know, if you're listening to this and you, and you haven't really, you don't have like a direct line to, um, th this form of discourse, like it, this, it, it, Seth's not exaggerating at all. This is completely real. And I agree. It's sort of gleefully amusing. It's also horrifying uh, to watch people just say like, yes, I am devoted to the thing that the government said five minutes ago via its official media channels. And I'm so devoted and so that I'm ready to admit that this was was not actually ever about public public health or science it was never about you know what was going to work most it was always about signaling about tribalism and so yeah like there there's that element of it um it's hugely to, to me it's 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 both hilarious and hugely dispiriting i was at the grocery store the other day and they you know they they there's no mask mandate here anymore but they have these regular announcements where they used to say you know hi shoppers like welcome to kroger you know Please make sure to cover your nose and mouth with a with a face mask. Instead of just like canceling those announcements, like they obviously should have, they replaced them with the same person in the same tone of voice explaining that you should cover your nose with your hand when you sneeze. It was, <laughs> it's, it's literally like to prevent the spread of germs, like cover your nose and mouth with your hand if you sneeze or use your elbow. Like... There is this like there, there's a certain aesthetic that people are not willing to let go of. And this brings me to the one other thing that I sort of wanted to say about this phenomenon, which is in that Atlantic piece by Dana Stevens, which is called Excuse Me If I'm Not Ready to Unmask. Um, she gets to this really interesting point, And all of this is so revealing, right? She says, 
that she set a high standard early on the pandemic. Early on in the pandemic, I made a vow with my family that we would set a high standard for COVID-19 avoidance. Not only were we not getting this virus ourselves, if we could help it, but we were taking no chances of inadvertently spreading it to anyone else, even if that did make for a long and lonely year without indoor gatherings and travel to see family and friends. This is the sentence that really blew my mind. I didn't want to go to my grave thinking that I was a link in some chain of human interaction leading to someone else's serious illness or death. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, just, you should like, if, if that is what you want, you, you should remove yourself from all human society. Like I, I remember reading in, in grade school about the Janes, Janists, I think yeah. they're called the people <laughs> that like pick the bugs out of their lettuce before they eat it. Like they're, that human life just is being involved in long chains of, of human interaction. So it's like even the thing that they're signaling with the masks makes no sense. Like there is no universe. But but that reveals, right, that this was all this this logic only ever had one conclusion, which is like, well, we have to mask indefinitely because we like we, we, we're too pure to be involved in human life. Like we're, we can't accept the, the crushing moral weight of existing in the world because that has unintended consequences and like disease exists and and we cause pain and harm to others like this is this is like remedial ethical philosophy you you could read any basic text from the ancient world about like our moral accountability and where it starts and ends to know that this is like a totally unworkable idea about about ethics but it is amazing how bald it's now becoming how, how directly they're stating it all Yes, absolutely. And it, 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 it truly is. I mean, it's this whole denial of death, right? Uh, mm -hmm. This idea that somehow um, modern science, modern society can, in fact, cancel death right? Um, and make everything pure. Like, you know, I, there's an old anecdote about like an argument early in the 20th century between these socialists and they're like, you know, well, you know, look, socialism will be great, but we're never going to, like, eliminate streetcar accidents. Like, if a little child is run over by a streetcar, and they're like, yes, we will. We will eliminate streetcar accidents. There mm -hmm. will be no, 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 no such, um, like, you know, tragic deaths. And this is, I think, the attitude. And the idea that you would have any thoughts when you're going to your grave, much less thoughts of whether you participated in this chain of this trans this this chain of transmission is just sad and like i mean that's the funny thing about the term deathless like that's not like a positive term mm -hmm. like deathless indicates like the kind of sterility like mm -hmm. you, you have to you have to have death for there to be growth and you know i mean just generally speaking um, it's funny you bring up the Janes because, of course, one of the things the Janes do is wear a mask. They wear a gauze mask mm. to um, make sure that they don't breathe in any like little mites or bugs that are floating around and hurt them. Right? right. So that's like part of it. And this idea of like contain, like, okay, my um, one of my daughters who was actually extremely cautious, like she would wear masks and everything. She got COVID back in January or something. Mm. And whenever I mentioned this to people, they'd say, oh, how did she get it? <laughs> As though there was like a fault or a flaw that she had. I said, I don't know. How do you get a cold? I mean, the coronavirus, <sighs> the cold is a coronavirus. COVID is a coronavirus. They're highly transmissible. Like you can't. Who the hell knows where she got it? I don't know, living life? Yeah. Being in the world, even if you're being careful, yeah, occasionally something's going to sneak through. So this idea that it's possible to, to isolate, and you know, I think we've talked about this before, just the whole idea of stay safe, like remain safe. Um, right. You know, put yourself, it, it, I mean, unless you're going to be in suspended animation, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just not a thing. Yeah. You know, one element of this that does sort of in, in, in the tragic sense of life, it sort of fills me with a certain sorrow and compassion is that, you know, there are really crushing, tragic truths about being a human in the world. And obviously, as a Christian, I have 
a very specific sort of theological framework for understanding all of those things as consequences of the fall and hoping for their eventual, you know, resolution at the resurrection, all these things. But you don't have to be a Christian to engage with the tragedy of life, like many, many robust philosophical and moral and theological systems exist, you know, stoicism or whatever, for, for grappling with the ways in which life is broken, life is messy, life is inherently tragic. I mean, all, all of these things are true. And I have to say, like, the place where I have empathy for this is like, I have always felt that very, very deeply. Like, I, the, my earliest memory, I, I think, really, maybe uh, of all uh, is that I, <laughs> I suddenly realized that everybody I knew, like, th that I had never heard of anybody not dying. And so I asked my mom, I was like, so if you don't get sick, and if you don't, like, get hit by a car, like, do you just go on living? And she had to explain to me that, like, death of old age is a, is a thing that people just eventually die. And I, <laughs> like, just completely lost it, like like wailed through things, like was was completely because I was like so depressed, like and I still feel that way, like I'm still super depressed about the fact that death exists. Like I don't think that we should be numb to that at all. But I feel as if our society has like no way of teaching people that these things are true, they are permanent, they are tragic, and like helping them to grapple with that and to like get through that temper tantrum that I had as a little boy, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and now it's like everybody is suddenly because coronavirus is this high profile politicized thing that does indeed, you know, cause deaths, especially among older people and people with conditions, you know, like so suddenly people are like, uh, they're completely without resources to deal with that fact. And they've never even like considered it before. Well, yeah, I think you're right. And, and, you know, there, there is some, the extent to which America and American life um, insulates us from death, the way in which we put our old and sick away for them to die, so it's yeah. not something that we see. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, you, you see this in all discussion of American culture, especially post, post war, of, you know, the, you know, the, the basic. Uh, air conditioned sterility of American mm. life, such that we try to keep all like all odor uh, away away from us. Mm. So you know, all stink, all decay. You know, natural. I mean, there's good reasons for that. I mean, because that stuff is horrible. Right. But you know, then there's there's a downside. I guess you know one positive thing. What I don't know if it's positive, but one sort of poignant way to frame the whole mask obsessiveness is like to think, well, maybe people are wearing masks because they think they're ugly and yeah. it's in, they're, they're, they're embarrassed of themselves. Wow. And they like having the mask on because it makes them feel secure. Right. Um, right. And I think there's something a little, I mean, a little sad about that, that people, that people are embarrassed to be humans in the world and showing off their imperfect faces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so this is like a way for them to hide. Mm. Uh, and you know, I, I don't know, maybe that's like a, maybe that's a way to look at it to, to, so, to, to allow us to, 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 we, we should feel pity and some sympathy for people who, who want to like, like, you know, um, hide their faces because, huh. because they're so, they, they think of, cause they can't deal with the fact that they're, that they're grotesque. And that humans are, are kind of have a, a growth that we have a growth. There's a grotesquery to our, to our, to our nature. Yeah. We're kind of, we're kind of, I mean, Hamlet says this, right. We're, we're sublime, but also ridiculous beings, right. What, a, what a piece of work. And, uh, and yet yeah. to me, a quintessence of dust and like, um, yeah, I, I, you're, you're making me think about the sort of governing experience for me of this pandemic has, has been, you know, often walking into places where masks are required or or heavily enforced and not wearing one and that feeling of like oh my gosh my face is hanging out you know and you kind of endure it i i endure it to like make a point you know but it is sort of like whoa i'm suddenly very exposed to all of these people that are behind this barrier this protection you know um 
Well, this is all uh, the, the psychology of it is so fascinating. We could kind of talk about it for the whole episode, but we did. There was one other thing that we really wanted to get to because we haven't addressed it yet. And that, that's what's going on in, in Israel right now. So I'll just sort of lead us in and then we can talk about how the left is responding. And, and really, I'm actually, Seth, we haven't, you and I haven't talked about it even off mic. So I'm very interested to know what's on your mind. Um, I, I'll, I'll read just a quick paragraph from a Fox News article about this, not representing that as sort of the, the ideal or most neutral way of describing it, but just as a, as a starting point for some basic facts, and we can contest the characterization in it if, if we choose. Um, here's, here's Fox. The latest round of violence that is between Israel and Palestine was ignited over the possible eviction of Palestinian families from their homes in the East Jerusalem neighborhood Sheikh Jarrah, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Coming off the heels of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, Palestinians in East Jerusalem took to the streets and demonstrated at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest site in Islam. Following a heavy-handed response from the Israeli security forces, Hamas militants in Gaza responded by firing rockets into Israeli, uh, Israeli cities. And that last sentence really describes, I mean, the kind of aggression that Hamas is known for among people who understand who Hamas is and don't just say, well, the democratically elected, you know, government of Palestine, the free Palestine or whatever, you know, this is a terrorist organization and they, they do terrible things. They hide rockets in schools. They use civilian shields. Um, and then like just the insidious gullible and evil dupes that they are, the American media then says, oh, is Israel is the aggressor here. They're targeting civilians. And this is, of course, not true at, at all. Um, we, we've been watching from the states with increasing, I think, just, well, we're, it's it's riveting and it's it's horrifying to to watch Israel have to fight for its, its mere existence. There were some really striking images that emerged from it, one of them, the the sort of use of the Iron Dome, which is this anti-missile defense system. You can look up pictures of, of these rockets basically being shot out of the sky and therefore heavily reducing the casualties that Israel would otherwise have suffered. But still, it's terrible tragedies we're seeing in, in, in these Israeli neighborhoods, um, on top of which, of course, our left, the American left, has just put its cards on the table. I mean, it's amazing, the not just the ignorance and disinformation, but just the sheer anti, I mean, anti-Semitism is the only word that I have to describe it, the sort of conviction that the only Jewish nation state should be basically wiped off, off the map. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has made statements that amount to this. Essentially, um, there have been a number of just really vile leftist statements on the topic, which I'm sure we'll get into as, as we talk. But Seth, uh, I, I'm going to turn it over to you so that I don't just r ramble through this. Is there anything in what I've just said that you would contest, things that I missed? What, what's been your assessment of this situation? Um, no, I mean, I think you're, uh, you're pretty right. You know, a, a lot of the time these things, well, you know, every five years or so when, when like a battle breaks out, uh, you know, I think a lot of time Israel does, you know, I don't know if you would say overreact, but they certainly uh, they don't hold back necessarily. Um, right. And it's funny because those are the times like when, you know, look, in the past, people have said, OK, yes, Gaza, Hamas shoots rockets over. But what are these rockets? I mean, they're not really anything just like, you know, um, glorified fireworks. Uh -huh. This time they really are sending over some pretty serious surface to surface missiles right i mean something i think is kind of funny is we always hear and to some extent i'm going to accept that you know oh gaza isn't i think christopher hitchens called it an open air concentration camp and people really uh like that they they, they like the aoc types parrot this a lot yeah that it's you know that they're held under blockade that they're held under siege that the people are starving whatever um, well, I have to say, uh, a blockade that keeps out baby aspirin and, uh, you know, formula, <laughs> but lets in thousands of these, these rockets must be the worst attended embargo in human <laughs> history. Uh, I, I mean, clearly this, this blockade is pretty ineffective. 
on some level. Hmm. If they can manage to import, I mean, just think about what kind of infrastructure you need to support right. the storing of thousands, thousands of these missiles hmm. and to transport them and to fuel them. And, you know, I mean, it's obviously it's a huge operation. Right. So, you know, there's a whole question of the resources and what Hamas is doing with the billions of dollars it collects from Europe and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, there's that, which kind of militates against the idea that this is just a, a one-sided you know, like Israel just stomping on on Israeli on Palestinian children's necks. Right. Um, and as far as the left goes, yeah, they've been ex they've been like more cynical or gullible or whatever you want to call it than usual. Yeah. And I think that's going to pose major. I think that's going to be a major issue for the um, for the Democrats because American Jews provide i believe between 50 and 75 percent of funding to the dnc right a yeah huge is... amount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and you know if they keep pushing this this narrative you know i i mean i imagine some jews will just be willing to cut ties just like let israel go but they're not all going to Right. Well, I mean, I think there is a fair degree of, you know, the intersection of American Jews and the left in that intersection there, there are fair, there's a fair degree of people that are like pretty big Israel skeptics, but even the, the most sort of devoted Israel skeptic who is Jewish has to be looking at some of this stuff that's coming out about the, you know, the people that that the squad are defending, you know, this this from the river to the sea garbage where you're, you know, which is basically a call for the wholesale eradication of Israel, right? One would hope that that would give people pause. I mean, we've waited in vain for other racial minorities to uh, like realize that the Democrats are not their friend. It, you know, it actually, you do actually have to offer something on the other side. Like it took Trump who was actually appealing to Latinos to sort of siphon away a lot of Latino votes from the Democrats. But um, I mean, I think one thing that makes it really easy for the left to do what it is doing, that is to portray Israel as these violent aggressors is that like, we are so at least for now, strong, fat and happy that we're just not at all used to the sound of a leader and a nation like fighting for its life. Like Bibi Netanyahu and Joe Biden had this interaction today where Biden says he expects a significant de-escalation today on the path to a ceasefire. Um, and Netanyahu says he's determined to continue in this operation until its objective is achieved. You know, this is like a hard scrabble nation that is not at all does not have the death, death wish that America's ruling elites seem to have like does not hate itself thinks it should exist and is going to like be really dedicated in warfare as all nations that are serious about winning must and none of that is to say that right I mean what you point out Seth is true like they're they're actually incredibly more like the the IDF is incredibly careful morally circumspect um, considers these issues does not just shrug them off but like you know a nation at, under existential threat that is at war like must express a certain hard nose determination and we are so allergic to that because we like you know we haven't had to deal with the icky stuff kind of like with covid you know that that the left can sort of say well look at these ruthless you know ruthless fighters and people that don't think things through kind of can go along with that i think well you know every leader in in the world who doesn't want to commit um suicide particularly of like you know you're like look at victor orban of hungary mm. or Netanyahu or basically any leader who isn't like committed to uh you know opening the opening the floodgates of immigration and 
you know, destroying its borders and so forth is considered a monster mm. in the eyes of the left. Um, Netanyahu, and you know, it, it is considered particularly bad. Um, I'm interested in this whole idea that anti-Zionism does not equal anti-Semitism, and I'm willing, on some level, to accept, you know, that well, maybe that is true. I mean, I think that it would be po- sure you can argue with the policies of Netanyahu without hating Jews, <laughs> but. But I've actually sort of come around to accepting the idea that, uh, except in maybe a few cases, like, you really have to ask the question, well, why do you care? Like, why is this the one conflict that bothers you more than anything else? Like, people go on about how, well, Israel doesn't really exist. It's only been around for, like, no time at all. It has no history. Well, what about Pakistan? (laughs) Like, or what about India? Like, as nations as like you know nations in the modern nation as nation states look at any country in africa they're right. all just like brand new what the hell uh, um uh. like who what, what you know the whole world the world order as it is isn't very old right um i mean and the whole idea of the nation state is so some people say well before the 19th century zionism didn't even exist <laughs> well in its in in this context yes but Neither did nation states, period. Right. When did Italy come into existence? When did Germany come into existence? These were just like conglomerations of principalities that spoke vaguely the same language. Right. Not even. I mean, they all had different dialects. So, right. uh, I mean, Herzl is like, you know, comes of age with the, the like the basic existence of Germany. By yeah, her, like, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But I think it's funny because... But what seems to me, this whole idea that, okay, well, people like to say, well, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitic. And then I feel like they add in a corollary, which is, and since I'm an anti-Zionist, I can't be anti-Semitic. <laughs> um, so right. I, I almost feel like <laughs> That's interesting. People, yeah, yeah. people are taking their anti-Zionism um, and very quickly and maybe not even understanding what, what's happening in their mind. They're adopting all of the classic anti-Semitic tropes of yeah. Jewish domination, Jewish evil, and just translating it into Zionism, and hmm. thus they think sanitizing it. So, oh no, it's not that Jews control the world, but Zionists control yeah. the world. <laughs> uh, it's not that that you know Jews are nation destroyers, but Zionists certainly are. Um, right, so I think, I think, dual loyalties. Yeah, I think we're seeing some of that. I don't know. I think this is going to be a major issue. I, I mean, it's weird to see Democratic. I mean, I keep hearing AOC and you know, Ayanna Presley saying that Israel is um, imprisoning Palestinian children. Right. Now, what the hell are they talking about? That makes it sound as though they're rounding them up and like putting them in like mass internment <laughs> but i, yeah. I don't I, what are they talking about uh, mm, i mean i i assume it's along the lines of the kids in cages thing where it's like you know there there have been some events that have necessitated like and, and the, the same thing with the you know d- directly contributed to the one of aoc's things like by by funding israel we've directly contributed to the displacement of millions and it is i mean i really agree with you about this this slippage between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, like, first of all, at some spiritual, you might, you can call it superstitious level if you want. Like, I really do believe that Jew hatred is sort of like the original poison in the blood of humanity that like the minute anybody, I mean, I, I like, like when wokeness started to become a thing, I was like, set your watch, set your watch for the time when that will start coming for the Jews. Because they really do. I mean, people like all evil eventually morphs into anti-Semitism it, uh, and and like whatever. I think this is because the Jews are God's chosen people. We hate God, so we hate the Jews. But like, you know, this is like a um, a sort of a separate tangent, except to say that there are always these versions of it where that like there are all of these arguments that that sort of seem in the like in the abstract yeah i guess i could see how you would object to certain aspects of how israel was 
you know, settled as a nation state, refounded, you know, in, in the 20th century. In practice, though, it's sort of like when when people start making arguments against circumcision, like this is also a thing now that circumcision is a form of genital mutilation. And so it should be outlawed in certain European cities like this there are countries. Right. And you sort of say like, OK, but so functionally, first of all, this is a like, you know, men, this is a practice of many, many thousands of years. There are all sorts of arguments why it's not genital mutilation. But even if we say like, you know, we have some moral quandaries about circumcision as a, as a thing, right? Like it, the, it is textually obvious that you cannot be an observant Jew and and eschew circumcision as a right. Like it is entry into the covenant for male children. And so like the, all of your sort of like I guess what I'm saying is that when people start making these sort of arguments about, well, like morally, whatever, can we really allow this in ours? We do this. It's like, I just, I just smell a rat. Like I just smell the stench of that old evil. And I feel exactly the same way here. It's like, yeah, we can split hairs about like, you know, every nation has made mistakes in its past, like which, you know, who's, who's right and who's wrong on this picayune individual issue. But the way that they talk about this stuff, it is, it's the, it's, they're talking about about Judaism, right? They're talking about like their their hatred and distaste for like the Jewish people, the Jewish nation as a presence in the world at all and certainly in the Middle East. And yeah, I, I think it's become it's becoming more and more obvious because that's always what was under the surface. Um yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um I mean there is there's a weird thing in the West where all forms of particularism are adored except for Jewish particularism, which right. is just seen as exclusionary right. and annoying. And this has always been the thing with the, um, I mean, going back to like the classical kind of uh, religious um, opposition to, to, to Judaism, which is like, why are you trying to set yourselves apart? Sure. And insist on this um, exclusivity and this exclusive covenant with God that you think you have. Um, you know, I saw some guy who was saying, like, here's the thing. Uh, he was some kind of, you know, very vulgar Christian apologist saying, like, rabbinic Judaism, like, like modern Judaism for the last 2,000 years, is entirely based on the denial of Jesus. <laughs> and so it's not really a religion. Their whole, all they do is deny Jesus. Right. And I said, like, yeah. you don't understand. You are centered around Jesus. So you assume right. that everybody else is too. But if you talk to Orthodox Jews, they don't give Jesus a second thought. Like, Judaism is littered with figures like false messiahs right. and various, like, you know, what they would call like, you know, nuts or like whatever, like side figures. Right. Like we are these Jesus obsessed heretics, the Christians who just like went off on this other More thing. Or less. And so and, we imagine, right, that this is what Judaism is about. Yeah. 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 But um, I don't know. Uh, I, the whole question of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, I mean, I could probably expatiate about this for like hours just right. because it, it's like, it's really fascinating. But you know, like when Helen Thomas, the the AP report, she was the AP the, or UPI reporter said, uh, you know, she kind of, I mean, she was Lebanese and she said, oh, the Jews need to go pack up and go back, get out of Israel, go back to Poland. Right. Um, you know, and then, well, that begs the question, well, you have to realize like more than half the country of Israel are Mizrahi Jews or Sephardim who, right. you know, lived who lived in that region and basically were all expelled from the Arab countries and they lived there like pre-Christian. I mean, these are ancient communities. And then it said, well, they should, they had no problem before Israel. There was no, there was like, they, they did very well with Arab leadership. So, I mean, there's all kinds of like just crazy denial twisted into this. And I mean, it's just the idea that, like, like from the river to the sea, well, they would say, well, we, that doesn't mean that we want to expel anyone. It just means that we think that from the river to the sea, it should all be one state, one free state. <laughs> right. But at the same time, 
like a place like Tel Aviv didn't exist until the Jews bought the land and built it. But that too was supposed to be like, you know, given back. Well, um, I mean, this is like, you know, the, and, and not to just continually flog a high horse to mix metaphors about the hypocrisy of the left. But I mean, this is a political movement. The left is a political movement that is in America right now, basically like essentially burning at the stake anybody who expresses even the the most minor form of intolerance or or ignorance you speak out of turn you slip your you, you know your tongue slips and you are now a homophobe you're a terrible person like just as a you know i don't know if people know or understand this but tel aviv gay pride is like the if, i mean it's the only gay pride essentially in for for <laughs> who knows unspeakable miles around it is an enormous it's like you know, bigger than like practically bigger than San Francisco pride and not by the way, because like the Jewish state is so like gung ho on homosexuality and not because it's like this orgiastic bacchanal over there of like gayness, but because it's literally the only place anywhere that these, that people are even tolerated. Like, you know, it's, it's enormous. It's like that, that is not happening in, in middle, in other like Arab middle Eastern countries. Like, so this is this weird thing where if you really believe in the exportation of tolerance around the world, if you're like so gung ho about about, you know, sexual liberation, you should be like begging Israel to like take total control of as much area as they possibly can. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, I, 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 I do just sort of feel as if, you know, the 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 Jews obviously have been there since antiquity that they're they're being like placed into this situation now where they have to defend once again defend themselves against encroaching surrounding civilizations which by the way is what they were doing in, in biblical times too and i i just don't i guess i don't see how this is like a morally complicated issue at, at, at bottom i understand how different parts of it might like provoke argumentation but i i cannot understand feeling as if israel has anything other than a total right to exist and defend itself well, it's funny. Um, two things. One about the 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 gay gay liberation. Right. Uh, from the left, you'll often hear about people complain about pink washing, and they'll say right. we have to watch out because Israel is just pink washing. And what they mean by that, it's like you know, play on white washing that Israel tries to cover up all of its human rights abuses by pretending or by presenting the fact that it gives freedom to its gay to gay people right except that they really do give freedom to gay people <laughs> right that's actual they, <laughs> they certainly don't throw off roofs which is what it's, they do in neighboring nations right, right right it's not like it's not like a charade that they're doing like there's right. actual literal freedom um but then it's funny because then you'll hear right-wing critics of israel not really right like you know like i'm talking about extreme right like nazi oh, sure. essentially They'll complain like, oh, well, that's just more example of Israel, of how Jews pollute <laughs> morality. Right, right. Um, you know, and, and these are the types maybe who would, you know, convert to Islam like happily because, sure. it, it, you know, there's family values at least. Yeah, you know, I mean, whether Israel has, is, is morally right to do whatever, I mean, it's a country. So yeah, they're going to get in wars and they're going to fight. And it's absurd. I think it's very interesting that the left in America is so anxious and so excited to, to cast everything in terms of BLM. Mm. And we saw this like five years ago when BLM first started, like there are all these Palestinians, they're really eager to yoke the two movements right i mean and, blm did come out with a you know obvious expected but emphatic statement of support for palestine in this conflict sure uh and you know i think we're going to see more of that and i think what they're trying to do is yoke um young americans naive sympathy for blm and just turn it into you know this idea that it's that it's that the whole thing is about colonization 
right. and you know the, these revolutionary movements. So, I mean that that's the effort. That's the effort. Well, you know, I don't know if it's going to work or not. But what's really interesting is, like you said, well, you didn't say, but if you notice, the 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 media keeps trying to say, oh, well, this shows how Trump's Abraham Accords were a failure, except. Trump never dealt with the Palestinians. Trump's whole, Trump and Kushner's whole strategy, which is what drove Obama and the, the, the Obama-Biden, like, you know, the regime mad, was that instead of trying to suck up to Iran and the Palestinians, whom they saw as the key to the new region, Kushner and Trump just went around and, and dealt with all these other countries. Right. Who, obviously don't care about the Palestinians. Everyone in the region is sick of the Palestinians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They should have just, look, when India and Pakistan had partition, there were something like 10 million people on each side had to switch places. Hmm. Hindus had to, from Pakistan had to go into huh. India. Tons of millions of people died. Huh. This type of thing was happening all do you know how many Sudeten Germans were expelled from Czechoslovakia? Three hmm. million huh. in the, in the, in, right after World War II. Yeah. It was massive, massive displacement. And in almost every instance, these refugees just became part of their, where, where they wound up. Hmm. And, and the, so the Sudeten Germans, the Czech Germans, you don't hear them talking about going back and reestablishing their lands in uh right. even, you know in, in in it's over you don't hear like there's no talk of like uh hindus wanting to go back to where they lived in like you know um karachi or wherever and get their houses back hmm. um this was all a cynical ploy to establish a i mean another thing i, I know i'm kind of jumping around here but the Palestinians are the only refuge, only people in the world who have for whom refugee status is heritable. So when mm. they talk about refugees, like six million displaced, they're talking about the great grandchildren of refugees. Yeah. Who are living in camps, like so-called camps that are just basically cities by this point. So it's all an abuse of language. It's it's ridiculous. Nobody cares in that region. Saudi Arabia, you're not seeing Saudi Arabia, Sudan, UAE, Morocco, Egypt. None of these countries are like sending troops to aid Hamas. Right. Nobody cares. They keep saying Turkey will send. Nobody is interested. It's only the American left mm. and like, you know, Canadian, you know, dopes who are getting really excited about this. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, uh, I mean, that analogy point is really important. I mean, Angelo Cotavilla, who uh, writes for the American Mind and CRB from time to time, pointed out when COVID hit how easily all of these different causes got kind of amalgamated into one and like BLM basically just like sucked up the mask thing. And it all sort of follows this, this similar logic. And as you say, they just sort of smuggle one in with the other, there, there's, you know, regular efforts to analogize, like, you know, the, the Palestinian struggle. I think, I think it was Ayanna Pressley who said something like, it's the same, what they're doing to the Palestinians is the same as what the police are doing to black people here, which is sort of like, it's not even remotely the same. And the issue, I mean, even if you believe that Israel is like more at fault than I believe, like, <laughs> The, the, it's a completely different region, history, situation, issue. So as you say, it is a, it's a slippage of language. It's this like very, you know, politically savvy sleight of hand. And, and most of it, of course, is about like, you know, garnering a, get, frothing up a, a mob for whatever purposes they, they choose. We, <laughs> we were given permission to go not as long because there was only two of us, but we have in fact gone just as long. We had plenty to talk about uh, and we have to kind of stop it, stop it there. So I will close this out, I guess, by just saying thank you for listening to The Roundtable. If you want to support our work, visit claremont.org slash donate. 
If you want to learn more about all our projects and writing, visit our websites at AmericanMind.org, Claremont.org, ClaremontReviewOfBooks.com, and our brand new Washington-based Center for the American Way of Life at DC.Claremont.org. I will add, since whenever I grab the mic, I am uh, do my best to be more shameless than Ryan in plugging our stuff. You should subscribe to this podcast. You should leave us five stars on Apple Podcasts. You should subscribe also to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so that you get notifications. Do all of these things because you will not regret it. We make good content. The other last thing is that our Substack is AmericanMind.Substack.com. It's called American Mindset. You sign up for it. You get all sorts of based takes delivered straight to your inbox, including regular one-on-one conversations between me and Seth and members of other other members of the American Mind team. Thanks, as always, to the production and engineering crew, Jake Gannon and Annalisa Lee. And thank you for listening. We will talk to you next week. 